Good morning, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Inquisition Update. My name's Tom Fress, and I'll be your host for the next hour. You're listening to FirstAmendmentRadio.com, and thanks for tuning in, as always. Having returned from a long weekend, I find it necessary, or possibly advantageous, to recap a bit. We've been laying the foundation, laying a foundation for the further reading of this uh, little book entitled The Origin of Futurism and Preterism. And having come back from the weekend, I find it uh, probably beneficial that we do a bit of of, uh, rehearsal here to pick up where we left off. First, the author is defining the various schools of Bible prophecy interpretation. There are three. The first is historicism. This is the ancient method by which the prophecies of the book of Revelation and Daniel were interpreted. Okay? This is the method of interpretation held by the first century church. And throughout the generations, throughout the Christian era, there have always been those who held to the original interpretation of the book of Revelation. Historicism says the original interpretation of, of, of uh, prophecy says that the book of Revelation simply foretells all the events that take place throughout the Christian era from the first century Christians until the time of Christ. From, from the time that it was written by John the Revelator until the return of Christ. It lays forth all of the historical events that we've seen with our eyes unfold over the last roughly 2,000 years. That makes sense, doesn't it? That God would foretell the entire events throughout the Christian era from the time of his of the first century Christians until his return? You've got to ask yourself, if historicism isn't correct, then then why did God not tell us what would happen during 2,000 years of Christian history? Would he leave us blind? Would he leave us in doubt? His people for whom his son died and bled for to redeem? Would he be so interested in us knowing for certain who his son is and what he did for us, would he then leave us in doubt about who the great deceiver would be throughout the church age, who the Antichrist would be? That's untenable. He put forth his son to bleed and die for our salvation. He wants us to know who his son is and to believe in him. Just as we believe in the Father, we are to believe in His Son, too, and trust Him. Now, if God put forth His only begotten Son to bear our punishment, why then would God leave us in doubt about who the great deceiver is? Playing fast and loose with the souls of the men, women, throughout the Christian era, who believed in Jesus, for whom Christ died. It's untenable, okay? It makes no sense. It, it, it's, well, it's blasphemy to believe such a thing. <clears throat> now, the historicists, those who understood that Daniel's prophecies together with John the Revelation, they go together, foretells the entire history of the Christian church and the persecution of the Christian church and the shedding of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus and the wearing out of the saints. By whom? By the false Christ. Okay? The one with the golden cup in his hand, the purple and the scarlet, the color of his bishops and his cardinals, Gold, silver, and precious stones and pearls, wearing out the saints of the Most High, seeking to change God's times and laws. 
shedding the blood of the martyrs of Jesus, persecution after persecution throughout the entire Christian era. I would thank God if he is truly righteous and holy, and I say he is, would not leave us blind to who the Antichrist is. Historicism saw that that power which replaced the Caesars, the Caesars who were restraining the rise of the Antichrist, when they were taken out of the way, when the Caesars were taken out of the way, then that man of sin was revealed. The man of sin, the son of perdition, the little horn of Daniel, the Antichrist was revealed early in Christian history, not long after the writing of the book of Revelation. Just as the Caesars at the fall of the old pagan Roman Empire were taken out of the way, what rose up in the power vacuum left in Rome by the Caesars was the holy Roman emperor, the papacy. Claimed to be Christian, still is still claims Christianity to this day, but he has fulfilled all the ugly prophecies in the book of Revelation about the changing of God's times and laws, about the shedding of the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus, being drunk with the blood of the saints, holding a golden cup in her hand, scarlet and purple. The whole schmear is a vivid color image of the Roman Catholic Church and the papacy. It, it says that he would, Little Horn would stand up and uproot three other kings. Little Horns, okay? That happened at the destruction of the Gothic nations early in the beginning of the Holy Roman Empire. The papacy uprooted three kings. Okay? The book of Revelation is a reliable, time-tested, scripturally tested, historically tested, and Without fail, the book of Revelation lays out the entire Christian era and the persecution of the saints. And there's not one possibility other than the papacy as being the man of sin, the son of perdition. That's why all throughout the Christian era, up until about 200, 250 years ago, true Bible-believing Christians, those who read their Bibles and understood it, proclaimed without reservation without equivocation, that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. That's historicism. That is the original interpretation of Bible prophecy. That is the one held by the first century Christians. That is the one held by all the saints throughout the Christian era. And it still remains the unquestioned the unchallengeable is probably a better description of it. The unchallengeably cor correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. There's one thing about historicism that you have to comprehend, and that is that it positively identifies who the Antichrist is. Okay? It's the papacy. Now, for the man of sin in Rome, the son of perdition, the Antichrist, that teaching had to be destroyed. Up rose the Inquisitions. They tried to burn the Bibles, because if you read the Bible, you read the book of Revelation, you read the prophecies, you can come to only one conclusion. The only one that satisfies the prophecies is the papacy, as the man of sin. So, you have to burn Bibles. That's what the papacy did. And then, if that doesn't stop the accusation that the papacy is the Antichrist, then you have to start burning Christians, too. And that's what the papacy did. And if burning Bibles and burning Christians becomes detrimental to the Roman Catholic Church, and even R Roman Catholics become uh, begin to recoil from the hideousness of this blatant and bloody persecution of the saints... Well, then Rome had to find other means, less bloody means, and they did. They wrote what rose out of this was two false interpretations of Bible prophecy, both of which exonerate the papacy. The first is called preterism. Preterism is the school of 
interpretation of Bible prophecy says that all the all the prophecies in the book of Revelation were fulfilled by the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. So that the Antichrist had to rise, live out his wicked days, and then be terminated by the fall of the Roman Empire, by the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. So now the Christian era from that time on, that is from the rise of the Holy Roman Empire, Antichrist is a figment of the distant past. No one should be concerned about him, but we should all be concerned about elevating the papacy to global supremacy. Make him God on earth. That's preterism. <clears throat> that the prophecies were all fulfilled by the time of the fall of the Roman Empire. Preterism, ironically, indicates that the Antichrist was Roman. And that we cannot deny. The papacy is Roman. Just as was the Caesars. The papacy calls himself Caesar. And that's one of his titles. King of Kings. That's why Roman Catholic canon law demands that all the kings of the earth must serve the papacy. They must rule the people in the papacy's behest. They must pass Roman Catholic canon law and make it the civil law of the land. They must force, willingly or unwillingly, all people, men, women, and children in every land to be, whether they profess Roman Catholicism or not, must make them obey Roman Catholic canon law. That's the whole history of the Christian era. Papacy has ruled over the kings of the earth, taken his Roman Catholic canon law, his papal bulls, his encyclicals, his pastoral letters, and legislating them into the form of civil law of every land. And if a king rebelled, then he was unseated. He was either uncrowned by the Pope or he was assassinated or poisoned or some other way of removing him from office and then a papist would be, would be recrowned by the Pope to put in his place. Okay? That's persecution of the saints from the first century or the, rather the rise of the, the so-called Holy Roman Empire to the present. And it's the Roman Caesar. Okay? That much the preterists have correct. They understand, apparently, that there are only four Gentile kingdoms until Christ returns. They understand that it began with the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian, the Greek, and finally the Roman. Okay? There's not a fifth. <clears throat> There's no other world empire but Roman. Now, the Brits can claim to be uh, an empire. The United States can claim to be an empire, but they're not empires unless they be Roman empires. And that simply means that Rome controls both Britain and the United States and every other government. But we have to understand this from Scripture. We either believe Scripture or we don't. Daniel laid out four earthly kingdoms. There have been four earthly kingdoms. And Jesus, just as Jesus said during the time of the Roman Empire, when he walked the streets of, the, of, of Jerusalem, he said, these are the last times. He simply was saying that Daniel's prophecy is correct. There were, there were the Babylonian Empire, the Medo-Persian Empire, the Greek Empire, and finally the fourth and the last, the Roman Empire, and it would rule until Christ returned. The same Jesus that saw the Roman Empire in, pa in power over Palestine at the time of his, of his ministry is the same Jesus that will find the same Roman Empire in power at the time when he returns. Or Daniel's a liar. You can't have it other, any other way. So the book of Revelation must lay out the history of the Roman Empire in this case, the Holy Roman Empire, as if there's any distinction at all between the Holy Roman Empire and the old pagan Roman Empire under the Caesars. There's no difference at all. 
Okay, there only appears to be a difference. There appears to be a form of Christianity, but it's not Christianity at all. It's anti-Christianity. All right, that's historicism. I saw, I'm sorry I couldn't be more brief, but there's much to this that we must comprehend. Historicism says the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist. He's the unchallenged Antichrist. There's no one even comes close. God made it just as easy to identify the Antichrist as he made it easy to identify his son. God does not play fast and loose with the lives for whom his son bled and died. We are to know just as assuredly who the Antichrist is as we are to know who Jesus Christ is. And we have all of history to compare and to contrast Christ with Antichrist. That's what the book of Revelation is all about. To reveal Jesus Christ by revealing his counterfeit. So you can see them both side by side. Make no mistake, historicism is the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. Preterism falls flat on its face, and everyone should know it. It says that the Antichrist is of the long-distant past. He's, not a, he's nothing but a figment of history, inconsequential to us today, and we are to be about the business of building a Christian kingdom for Christ to take over when he returns. That suits the papacy just fine, doesn't it? Interesting. Now we have the last and the most popular lie. It's called futurism. Futurism asserts that no preterism is wrong. Futurism is right, and futurism says that the man of sin, the son of perdition, is not going to appear on the world scene until just before Christ returns, and then the whole book of Revelation will be fulfilled in a few years. It asserts that God literally went to sleep for 2,000 years. There's nothing in the Bible that speaks to our generation, according to Bible prophecy, and that we ought to just go to sleep and wait for Jesus to come. And he's going to wake us out of our sleep by just zapping us out before zapping us out of this world in the so-called rapture before the Antichrist begins his persecution of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. Right? Let me explain something to my listeners. I said something that might be regarded as offensive to my listeners. Listen to what I'm about to tell you. I wasn't stupid enough to believe in preterism. But I was stupid enough to believe in futurism. For 50 years of my life, when I said Friday morning that, quote, if you're stupid enough, <clears throat> if you're not stupid enough, rather, to believe in futurism or preterism, you just might be stupid enough to believe in futurism. Well, I was the stupid one. I believed in futurism. That's all I was taught all my life. That the Antichrist is no concern of ours. That we should just praise Jesus till he comes, till he raptures us out of here, and then that man of sin will be revealed. I was one of the stupid ones. And if I live to be a thousand years old, I'll never live it down. I've been on my knees in repentance and sorrowful prayer to the Lord for my mistake for nigh unto 20 years. I don't insult my listeners. When I say these things, I'm speaking of myself. And since I am so grieved in my spirit about my error, it is my intent to spend the rest of my life making sure no one else makes the same mistakes that I did. You know, Paul was on his knees and on his face in repentance before the Lord his entire life after he was smitten on the road to Damascus for being the persecutor of the saints. 
Paul was of great humility, knowing that his apostleship would be challenged by God's own people because he started out persecuting the saints of the Most High. But God spared him and raised him up and made him an apostle. And he risked his life morning, noon, and night to spread the gospel of Jesus Christ all over the known world. Now, I couldn't carry Paul's shoes. Okay? Not qualified. Not apostle. I'm not an apostle. I'm not a prophet. I'm nothing but I am of great humility when it comes to my sin. My sin was futurism. And I repent of it till the day I die. Just as Paul repented of killing and mercy, mercilessly killing the saints of God before God lifted him up. So when you hear me say such things as, if you're not stupid enough to believe in preterism, you just might be stupid enough to believe in futurism, I'm speaking of myself. Speaking of myself. Now, what does futurism teach? First of all, I'll tell you, futurism is the predominant teaching in the churches today. For at least for a while, futurism had defeated preterism. There weren't many preterists around. Futurism looked like it was the correct interpretation of Bible prophecy. Futurism insists that Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, was not fulfilled in Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago. That it was not Jesus Christ who made a covenant with many for one week. It was not Jesus who in the midst of the week caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease. That it was not him who made reconciliation for iniquity and put an end of sin and anointed the most holy. It was not Jesus that did that. It was not the Messiah that Daniel was prophesying about. Literally, that Jesus was not the Messiah. But that Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, is not talking about Jesus at all. It's talking about the Antichrist. That he would make a covenant with the Jews... For seven years, and in the midst of that seven-year treaty period where the Jews are allowed to begin animal sacrifices again, which requires a modern nation state of Israel, which requires Jews living in the land, which requires a rebuilt temple and a new holy of holies and a new and animal sacrifices by the Jewish priesthood, then after three and a half years he would cause those sacrifices and oblations to cease. Okay? He would renege on the treaty. And this one who causes the sacrifices and oblations to cease would then be recognized by the entire quote unquote Christian world as being the Antichrist of the Bible. And what does that do to the papacy? Completely exonerates the papacy. Same thing that preterism does, doesn't it? Now, do you get the idea who wrote preterism and futurism? Now we're going to explain what has happened in history. Where are we today? This will be an eye-opener for my listeners that have never heard it before. Stay tuned. We've come upon the break. You're listening to Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. We'll be back right after these messages. Don't go away. First on FirstAmendmentRadio.com and FirstAmendmentRadio.net. 
If you'd like to get a copy of this program, you may subscribe at FirstAmendmentRadio.com for only $45 a month, and you'll receive an MP3 CD weekly of all of our programs. As a bonus, we'll send you a password for our audio archives online. That's a $15 value. Or you may request any month of any program on one MP3 CD for a minimum donation of only $25, or any single program on tape, MP3 CD, or CD for only $15. You may do all of this online at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Just follow the instructions to make a donation or subscribe. You may also adopt an hour of your favorite program. Please don't forget that most of the programs on FirstAmendmentRadio.com are listener-supported. Don't do Internet? Then call 559-781-3773 and we'll be honored to help you. Thank you from all of us here at FirstAmendmentRadio.com. Since the beginning of time, kings have sought it, nations have fought for it, it has been traded, it has been borrowed, it has been purchased, it has been stolen, there's a reason for it. To secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, invest with the security of gold and silver. Call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188 or visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net. Listen to Financial Survival with your host, Melody Cedarstrom, right here on FirstAmendmentRadio.com at 4 p.m. Eastern or 1 p.m. Pacific Time. Visit DiscountGoldAndSilverTrading.net or call Discount Gold and Silver Trading at 1-800-375-4188. Toll free, 1-800-375-4188. Welcome back from the break. You're listening to the second half hour of Inquisition Update on First Amendment Radio. And if you'd like to support Inquisition Update and keep this program on the air, please support First Amendment Radio. If you'd like to contact me, please do so by email. My email address is tom at seawaves.us. Tom at s-e-a-w-a-v-e-s dot u-s. Website is inquisitionupdate.org. Now... Where are we today? Well, the majority view, the historical view, throughout the almost the entire Christian era, historicism is almost unheard of today. Historicism t- says that the papacy is, was, and always will be the Antichrist, that he will reign in the Christian world from the time of its creation until the return of Christ, where he will be destroyed by the brightness of Christ's coming, he will be destroyed without hand. He will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming. That's historicism. Almost unheard of today. What is heard of everywhere is either the error known as preterism or the error known as futurism. And errors and errors tend to compete with one another, right? See, we go back to the analogy of the little boy who lied about getting in the cookie jar, said he was first, he was in the bathtub, so he couldn't have gotten in the cookie jar. Or if that didn't convince mom and dad, he told him he was down at little Jimmy's house during the time when the cookies had to have been taken, so it couldn't possibly be him. So mom and dad are looking at one another, so we got him, we got him. He told two contradictory lies. Now we know for certain who got in the cookie jar. Well, Rome told two lies, too. One was preterism. The other was futurism. Both exonerate the papacy. Both are diabolical and opposite lies. We can now pin the tail on the pontiff. Okay? That's where we are today. So while everyone should see the ridiculousness of both preterism and futurism, and likewise know for certain who the Antichrist is, instead of acknowledging the obvious, as in the case of the little boy who got in the cookie jar, mom and dad turning to one another, looking at one another and winking, we got him now. The preterists continue to fight and tell their lie against the futurists who continue to fight and tell their lie and both work together to exonerate the papacy. And it's as if mom and dad aren't catching on. 
That's how confused we are today. If we allow this war between preterism and futurism to continue like it's some legitimate argument, that both preterism and futurism ought to be considered as possibilities when they contradict one another, failing to comprehend the common origin of both, the papacy, and continue in our delusion. That's where we are today. That's where we've been ever since the foisting of futurism upon the world during the, uh, during the Oxford movement back at 1810. Okay? 1810. Almost 200 years. Futurism got its start in the Protestant seminaries about 1810 in England. Spread through the Schofield Reference Bible through the Plymouth Brethren and, and some, uh, some, uh, some, uh, Charismatic groups brought to this country, made popular in this country, and the United States is totally deceived. And our government, seeing the ridiculousness of the so-called Protestant churches and their argument back and forth between preterism and futurism, they've simply embraced the papacy. The papacy is all, is all powerful in Washington, D.C. Okay? When, when the Archbishop of New York walks into the Oval Office and sees Donald Trump in the Oval Office, they wink at one another and they continue to run the country together. And just let the Protestants, the totally deceived Protestants, the preterists and the futurists, just duke it out and Rome just laughs her diabolical butt off. Sorry for the expression, but at some point you have to <laughs> use terms that accurately describe what's going on. That's where we are today. Now here's what the author says. He says, for the past 50 or 60 years, and by the way, this book was written in 2006. It was copyrighted in 2006. He says, for the past 50 or 60 years, where would that put it? Right about the time of Vatican Council II, wouldn't it? Interesting. He says, for the past 50 or 60 years, Christian bookstores have carried the usual Bibles and books on Christian living. However, for the most part, their Bible study themes and their books concerning Bible prophecy were of the dispensational, pre-trib rapture, futurist point of view. In other words, for 50, 60 years, that is up until the time of 2006, when this book was written, every Bible bookstore dealt with prophecy, offered books for sale dealing with prophecy from the futurist point of view. The author is plainly telling you there's not a historicist Bible study that could be found in the Bible bookstores anywhere in this country. It's unheard of. Historicism, the true and unchallengeable School of Bible prophecy interpretation is virtually gone out of this country for at least 50 or 60 years. What, what now? Probably 80 years? Okay? Not good at doing math in my head. I flunk math. But look, you're either preterist or futurist. You don't even have the choice to be, to study historicist views of prophecy and history. They've taken, been completely taken off the bookshelves. The school of, of Bible prophecy interpretation that ruled unchallenged from the first century up until the early 1800s is totally unavailable in the Bible bookstores in history. You have but two choices, two schools of Bible prophecy interpretation available to be read and studied from the Bible bookstores in this country. That's either preterism or futurism. Now, who's responsible for that? The same Antichrist that wrote preterism and futurism. The papacy, the Roman Catholic Church. Okay? And those historicist books were taken off the bookshelves by the time of Vatican Council II, which says that the so called Protestant churches, those who bicker back or between preterism and and futurism, and never have even heard the term historicism, 
they're not even churches in the proper sense, according to Vatican Council II, because they don't have full communion with the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. So what are the Protestants supposed to do now? Well, admit that they can't get along. They believe in preterism, which exonerates the papacy. They believe in futurism that exonerates the papacy. They argue back and forth. They've made fools of themselves, ruling idiots in the eyes of the Roman Catholic Church, and they have but one alternative left, and that is to return lock, stock, and barrel to the Roman Catholic Church. You've proven yourselves fools. You've proven yourself unable to comprehend the Scriptures. You're unable to be churches in the proper sense. You've proven yourselves unworthy to exist without our instruction, without our oversight, and it's time for you to come back to the Roman Catholic Church. Your Protestant Reformation, upon which was built, uh, which was built upon the historic interpretation of Bible prophecy, the Pro Protestant reformers do without a doubt. Every single Protestant reformer embraced the historicists because it's the only one that existed. The historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy that universally condemns the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church as a synagogue of Satan headed up by Antichrist himself. Martin Luther attesting that the papacy is simply a mask for Satan himself. So you now don't believe that. You believe either the, the preterist view or the futurist view. You've exonerated the papacy. You've admitted by your actions by your beliefs, by your kings, by everything about you, you have proven that the Pope is not the Antichrist. So therefore, your Protestant rebellion was simply that, a rebellion, a childish rebellion against legitimate authority of God, the vicar of Christ on the earth, the papacy, and, you, and now you must return lock, stock, and barrel to the Roman Catholic Church. You must swallow Roman Catholicism whole, you must be on your knees making repairs or reparations to the Vatican for all that you destroyed of his kingdom. You must restore the papacy to global supremacy. You must do it by war, by economic war, by military conflict, by any means necessary. And you must do it at your own expense, both in material goods, in monetary forfeiture, uh, expenditure, and expenditures of blood and guts, your blood and guts. You Protestants who rebelled against the Pope with your phony Protestant Reformation, who have forgotten historicism and now believe in preterism and futurism, you must restore the papacy lock, stock, and barrel to the power and authority and prestige that he enjoyed before the Protestant Reformation. You liberated all of Europe from papal control. You wrote your own constitutions. You, you, you forgot Roman Catholic canon law. You elected your own kings that would rule at your behest instead of the papacy's behest. Because of the Protestant Reformation, the vicar of God on earth, the papacy, lost control of everything. The church was stripped of all of its wealth and power and influence. The papacy became a prisoner in his own castle. It's time for you to restore everything. And not just what the papacy enjoyed before the Protestant Reformation, but you must conquer the rest of the world where the Pope never ruled before. That's what was declared at Vatican Council II because of futurism and preterism. That's where we are today. This country has become the battle axe for the Pope. This once Protestant country has become the literal proxy warrior for the Pope, the Protestant proxy warrior for the Pope, conquering the whole world for the papacy. Restoring the Pope to his supreme position as God of this world. That's the whole function of the United States government today. To impose Roman Catholic canon law upon the people through leg civil legislation. To destroy the Protestant churches because they destroyed themselves with preterism and futurism. 
and make them Roman Catholic, whether they like it or not, whether they know it or not. That's what was determined at Vatican Council. The Council of Trent, which Martin Luther desired, would have eliminated the pussy altogether. Instead, Martin Luther died, the Council of Trent was held, and the papacy declared all-out war against Protestantism. What grew out of the Council of Trent was the alternative interpretation of Bible prophecy called preterism and futurism, and they didn't have to kill a single Protestant. They just let the, they just let the Protestants commit spiritual suicide by embracing one of these two false interpretations of Bible prophecy. And once the Protestants had defeated themselves through preterism and futurism, Vatican Council II was held to declare Rome's ultimate victory over Protestantism and give them an ultimatum, you either come back to the Roman Catholic Church or you're toast. That's where we are today. The author says, for the past 50 or 60 years, Christian bookstores have carried the usual Bibles and books on Christian living. However, for the most part, the Bible study themes of their books concerning prophecy were dispensational, pre-trib rapture, futurist point of view. Okay? These are just three words to describe the same diabolical crap. Sorry to tell it like it is. Dispensationalism is Jesuit crap. It's anti-Protestant crap. It was never believed by the historicism. You never heard the word dispensational from the, from the historicists. Pre-tribulation rapture, the word had never been heard in the, history, in the ancient Christian church. There is but one last trump. And that's when we are changed, in the moment of the trickling of an eye, when Christ returns. That is the resurrection. There is nothing such as the, uh, as the rapture even mentioned in the Bible. There's only one last trump. Anybody who believes in a rapture simply says there's more than one last trump. As if God couldn't write a coherent book. One last trump. That's the resurrection. There is no rapture. It's not taught in the Bible. You can only twist it out of the Bible if everybody's biblically illiterate and just believes every stupid thing that comes out of your mouth. But those who read the Scriptures are just plain as day tell you flat out there's nothing such as the rapture taught in the Scripture. That comes from the Jesuits. That comes as frosting on the futurist cake. Okay? Everybody hopes for the rapture, so they believe in futurism. See what I mean? If you tell them the rapture doesn't come, well, huh, then futurism is wrong. Well, they're not going to spit out that sweet rapture, so they're going to continue believing in futurism. And I'll tell you, bringing someone out of that futurist belief is nigh unto impossible. Nigh unto impossible. And I happen to be impossible. That's what God did for me. I claim no credit for it. I came kicking and screaming to the historicist interpretation of Bible prophecy. I wanted so much to believe that futurism was true. Now I've come to the bitter realization that the Antichrist was revealed Right after the writing of the book of Revelation, he's ruled over the Christian world for 2,000 years. He rules over me today. I'm, one, I'm made one of his subjects by the civil laws of this land. I'm as much a papist, though I profess Protestantism, as everybody else in this country. I'm bound by Roman Catholic canon law everywhere I turn. I'm persecuted by those who I once called brethren in the Christian world for preaching historicism in the first place and condemning futurism as a lie. I've got no friends anywhere. You don't hear me intimidated by any of it, do you? I know I'm right. I know God is right. And I know all the Christians throughout history from 1810 on back to the first century were historicists. They were true Bible-believing Christians. They had a hat on their head. They walked straight with Christ. They understood the Bible. And they marked the man of sin, the son of perdition, 
the Antichrist, the little horn of Daniel, the beast has no one but the papacy, and they were absolutely correct. I can stand in front of any and all opposition and without wavering make that testimony. But for 50 or 60 years, the teaching of historicism has disappeared from the Bible bookstores of this country. Your pastors have never taught you historicism. You may have never heard the word before. That's how rare the truth is in the Christian world today. That's where we are today. You've got one choice. Futurism. And the author says this was the popular view during that time because as history will substantiate, the high watermark of the futurist teaching was reached during the first half of the 20th century. During that era, many events came to pass that seemed to add credence to their theory. Listen. If Rome's going to pass off this futurist interpretation of Bible prophecy, then it's up to Rome to fulfill, to make it look credible, right? Now let me tell you how and to what extent the Roman Catholic Church, the papacy in particular, has given credence to their own lie. First of all, they created the modern nation-state of Israel. You can't cause the sacrifices and oblations to cease unless there are sacrifices and oblations going on, right? Well, who's going to offer sacrifices and oblations but a Jew? And how are they going to offer sacrifices and oblations when they didn't even have a place to hang their hat in Europe, let alone build a temple? So there had to be a modern nation state of Israel. Bingo, 1948, all of a sudden, there's a modern nation state of Israel. Then, there had to be Jews living in the land. Well, come to find out, when Theodore Herzl began talking about this, this Jewish homeland, the Jews responded to him, we're not going back to Israel. God dispersed us from Israel because we sinned. And we're not going back to Israel unless God leads us back there at just as he did when he brought us out of Pharaoh's Egypt. By a mighty right hand. Visible power manifestation of God. So that the whole world could see it. We're not going back to any homeland of the Jews until God demonstrates his power to us today like he did against Pharaoh's Egypt. So it became apparent to the papacy that the Jews were not going to go back to the Jewish homeland even if someone conquered Israel for them and took it from the Turks and made it available to them. They were not going to go. Now, look, you can't have a modern nation state of Israel as a place to refulfill Daniel's 70th week prophecy unless there are Jews living in the land because it's going to take Jews to build that temple and consecrate that temple. It's going to take Jews to make priests to make all animal sacrifices, isn't it? So you've got to have Jews living in the land or somebody posing to be Jews. So then there was the Second World War and the persecution of the Jews of Europe. All of a sudden, Jews who simply would never return to the ancient homeland of Israel unless God led them there with his own hand, all of a sudden ready to go to Israel, whether they wanted to or not, whether God led them or not. Interesting, isn't it? The Second World War was necessary to form a modern nation state of Israel to get Jews living in the land so that eventually a temple could be built and a priesthood established to make animal sacrifices and oblations again so that an antichrist can cause them to cease and so that the papacy can point the finger at that man as being the antichrist of the Bible. And once he's done away with, then the door is completely open in the Christian world for the acceptance 
of the papacy as the vicar of Christ, as sweet Christ on earth. See how this works? It's not difficult. It's not difficult. But first, before any of this makes sense, you have to understand the correct interpretation of Daniel's prophecy. It is the interpretation of Bible of Daniel's prophecy, chapter 9, verse 24 through 27, that was held by all historicists, all true Bible-believing Christians, for nearly 2,000 years, that it was not Antichrist, but Jesus Christ, who made a covenant with many for one week. One week, the 70th and final week of Daniel's prophecy. It began immediately after the end of the 69th week. The very next millisecond began the beginning of the 70th week of Daniel when Jesus, about 30 years of age, the age of a priest, was baptized in the River Jordan by John the Baptist, and there were three visible manifestations of God. A voice from heaven, a dove, and he said, this is my beloved son. Okay? That was the anointing. And for three and a half years, he confirmed the covenant in his blood with Israel, Daniel's people, Jerusalem and Daniel's people. In the midst of that week, he caused the sacrifices and oblations to cease by giving up his own life and becoming the very Lamb of God. And at that point, God's not going to accept any other sacrifice. So the temple and the veil of the temple were in the way. So God ripped the veil of the temple. Seventy years later, he caused the, to the temple to be destroyed, not one stone upon another. Do you think God is going to honor any Jewish temple? Do you think God is going to honor any sacrifice or oblation but that of his own son 2,000 years ago? So this is a war between Christ and Antichrist. The stakes are the Christian world, and the Christian world believes the lie. And I, in, I aim to change that, and I'll continue tomorrow. Visit CrossTheBorder.org, C-R-O-S-S, -S, CrossTheBorder.org, to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's CrossTheBorder.org. When it comes to prophecy today, much of the evangelical Christian world has their eyes on Israel, waiting and watching to see when the third temple will begin to be built. The plans are drawn. The Jewish people are eager. Most evangelical Christians today believe that the rapture will happen before the third temple is built. Hi, I'm Michael Eugene. I was taught that Daniel's 70th week was in the future. Is that really what the Bible teaches? Have we searched the scriptures and found this to be true? Why is it so important for a reestablished Israel to build a third temple in Jerusalem? Is it necessary to build a temple on the same location already occupied by the Dome of the Rock? Is it necessary for sacrifices to take place in the temple on Temple Mount? Is there really a rapture followed by seven years of tribulation? What is the New Testament temple? Can we identify history and prophecy? Who is the first beast in Revelation chapter 13? Who are the seven kings in Revelation 17? I have asked all these questions and I have found Nicholas Arthur's new book, When the Third Temple is Built, answers all these questions and more using scripture to interpret scripture. The Bible says that no prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. Nicholas shows us in his new book, When the Third Temple is Built, how the Bible interprets prophecy and not man's private interpretation. Visit crosstheborder.org, C-R-O-S-S, crosstheborder.org to get your print, EPUB, or PDF version of Nicholas Arthur's new book titled, When the Third Temple is Built. That's crossthebordered.org.